have uh, Susan Howe, Megan Long, and David Howe, who will be presenting to you tonight. And just in case you're not aware that, that there is a cooperative extension office here in Nicolai Village, we're actually right next door in the old library building. And uh, in addition to radon kits, we also have programs uh, for home landscaping. This is one of our publications and it has a plant list, recommended plant list, as well as information about best management practices. And another one of our faculty members put together the Living with Fire program for Lake Tahoe. So we're right next door if you ever uh, would like to check into some other uh, topics like that. And we, we have access to other uh, fact sheets and various, various subject matters. So with that, I'd like to introduce, are you going to start, Susan? I'm going to start. Okay. okay. Thank you, John. So um, the radon program is new within the cooperative extension in the last two or three years. And but radon isn't new. It's been around forever, as long as the, the earth is formed. But uh, one of the things that we do, especially during January, because it's National Radon Action Month, is we promote the radon health risk everywhere we can. So these are just some of the things that we've been doing. And I was just wondering if uh, you all came because you heard it through the newspaper or your Incline Village um, utility bill? Can I see a hand, raise of hands? Is that from the utility bill? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's great. That was one of our efforts to promote this. And can I see it? hands up how many people have tested already at all? Okay. So, so most of you are here to hear about learning about the library and worrying about radon. So I want to introduce you to Adrian Howe. He's my counterpart at home, and he works for the Nevada State Health Division. He's a radiation physicist. He's going to bring the message about <coughs> what radon is, how it gets in your houses, why you have to be concerned about it, and then we are going to have a mitigator here to tell you how he gets rid of the <coughs> radon in houses and mitigates the houses. So, Adrian. Okay, can everyone hear me? Good. She's got me quite good. is a naturally occurring radioactive gas. Uh, it's a decay product of uranium. Uh, we have uranium in all soils. It is in uh, higher concentrations typically in granites, phosphates, and shales. Uh, the radon itself is colorless, odorless, and tasteless. Uh, can't be sensed by any of, it, any of our senses. So the only way to know if you have radon is to test. And it's not really We've got radon. Radon is everywhere, including the outside air. Uh, the question is, how much radon do you have in your home, in your living space? As indicated, it's found all over the world. Uh, currently, EPA estimates uh, that one in 15 homes in the U.S. has elevated radon levels. As you'll see here in a little bit, we exceed that. This is a map that was developed during the 1989-1991 surveys in the state. Uh, this map gets out there. Uh, it's kind of misused. It was originally intended for local officials to determine if they needed to adopt building codes, uh, if they needed to develop a radon program for public information and outreach, that sort of thing. Uh, but it is out there. Uh, during those surveys in 1989-1991, it was determined that Nevada had about a 10% radon potential. Now, that was determined statistically. Actually, the test results that came back, about 19% of the homes that were tested exceeded the EPA action level. But because most of the testing was done in rural areas, and not very many tests were done in Reno or Las Vegas, they adjusted those results statistically for uh, population. What we're finding now statewide with the tests that have been done, and there are a lot more tests done both in populated areas and in rural areas, uh, statewide we're showing about 26% of homes in Nevada exceed the EPA action level. And obviously 
obviously all homes should be tested. That's our recommendation. Radon doesn't follow any geopolitical lines. It doesn't know where the county line is. The statewide average is about 3.62 feet per square meter, with the highest being found in Lake and Reno at 155.6. Find crystal bay. <laughs> I think people can hear me anyway. Uh, these are by zip code. And for those zip code areas, we range anywhere from 17%, almost 17%, to almost 36% of uh, the homes tested exceeding the actual. The highest being 63 feet of carry square meter. What, what, what time interval is that? These, these are all uh, short term screening tests, all three day tests, done under closed house conditions. Since 1989. Is that what you're asking? How long? No, I'm saying how long is the test? It's uh, three day tests. They're all short term tests, they're all screening done under closed house conditions. Not necessarily. Um, you know, I, I, around the lake here, certainly with what I'm familiar with in Nevada, uh, there's not as high a percentage in, in the north end of the lake as there is on the south end of the lake. Uh, Zephyr Cove runs about 69%. Um, I don't think that's changed too much. But about 69% of the homes exceed the action level. There's only been 12 tests in Crystal Bay, so it's not very really statistically valid at this point. A lot more tests have been done. Good point. So, what does that gray represent down by Kingsbury Grain? Um, I think it's the lake. Or not. I see the right there. Oh. Oh, I guess I'm looking at that purely. Oh. oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was thinking it surely was funny. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, when the, when the tests were done in 1989, 1990, uh, the indication was at that time that sparks uh, only exceeded the action level of about 6% of the homes. That was certainly before uh, we built out into the Spanish Springs area, and I've seen some uh, tests there that exceeded uh, 100 people curious to believe about the Spanish Springs area. Uh, so certainly as we have moved and started building in areas that we never built before, those, those statistics are going to change. Why we're concerned about radon uh, in particular, radon has been designated as a Class A carcinogen. And what that means is that we know that it causes cancer in humans. Uh, other uh, Class A carcinogens are tobacco smoke, asbestos, uh, we also uh, have statistically determined that radon causes about 20,000 lung cancer deaths per year in the United States. Uh, it is the leading cause of lung cancer among non-smokers. How do they determine 
that there were 20,000 lung cancer deaths that you can't detect right now. You can detect I mean, you, I mean, but you can detect it as a, as a cause of a lung cancer. <coughs> well, they can't say a, a single human lung cancer is caused by radon, just like they can't say it was caused by tobacco smoke. Uh, an individual person, it may be caused by pollution, tobacco smoke, asbestos, uh, or radon. So they can't say any one is. What they do look at are the, uh, we, you know, they, they've looked at minor studies in the past and looked at their lung cancer rate and extrapolated that. Then they look at average radon concentrations across the United States, the number of lung cancers, and extrapolate and statistically come up with, with this number. Uh, it has been verified this number actually rose a great deal when the National Academy of Sciences did a study, I'm thinking about five, six years ago. Uh, these are some of the groups that have recognized Radon is a serious national health problem. Certainly, Surgeon General um, has put out a statement that it is a serious uh, national health problem and people should test. Okay, um, these are kind of turned around a little bit, so I'll try and get into this a little bit. Radon has a three. 0.8 day half-life, and as a gas, we breathe it in and we breathe it out. Very little of that radon is actually going to decay in the lungs during that time period. So we're not really concerned about the radon itself giving radiation exposure. Uh, but when you have radon, radon decays down into radon decay products. Uh, these particles are solid particles, very small. Actually, we're talking the size of an atom for that particle. Excuse me. They're solid particles and they carry a charge. And as such, they will, about 50% of them will play out on our uh, furniture and walls. The other 50% become attached to dust particles, uh, moisture particles in the air. And some of them remain unattached, but they're available for us to breathe in. When we breathe those in, they become lodged in the lungs, in the lungs and they have a very short half-life. With that short half-life, they are what decay and give us the radiation exposure that can lead to lung cancer. How many, how many people in the United States per year die of lung cancer? Uh, don't quote me on this, but I believe it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 180,000 uh, lung cancer deaths per year in the U.S. I will show you some other statistics here in comparison. This, this is a, not a full uranium-238 decay chain, but these are the most common decays that, that occur in that decay chain. And, of course, we're going to have radon for a long time. What, what a half-life means, this number here is the half-life of, of each of these isotopes. What that means is that half of the atoms available will decay in that amount of time. So after that, amount of time, we're going to have half of those atoms left to still decay. When we get down here to um, <coughs> excuse me, radium-236, oops, no, that should be radium-238. <laughs> um, radium-226 is what decays by alpha emission into radon-222. As I indicated, the radon has a 3.8 day half-life. The radon uh, decay products that we're concerned about in particular are polonium-218. It's an alpha emitter. And polonium-214 as an alpha emitter. Polonium-218 has a 3 minute half-life. And here, polonium-214, a fraction of a second half-life. And the reason we're concerned about these is of the various types of radiation an alpha particle is a very large uh, particle. It carries a lot of energy with it. It won't travel very far in air, but um, 
It carries a lot of energy. It can be stopped. It's so large it can be stopped by our dead skin layer. It can be stopped by a piece of paper. But if it's sitting right next to the cell that it can do damage to, it does a lot of damage. To give you an idea, this is actually a depiction of uh, a piece of plastic that's contained in a long-term uh, radon detector, known as an alpha track detector. These little dots on here are actual alpha tracks where alpha particles have struck the plastic and caused damage to that plastic. And it's been magnified a hundred times. If you bring that down to a cellular level, you can see what kind of damage is, is occurring. This particular piece of plastic, and they use the same type of plastic that's used in uh, eyeglasses, in plastic lenses was exposed for three months at, an EPA, at the EPA action level before people curious for me. <coughs> Essentially, when those alpha particles are emitted, and they are... Uh, pardon me? Well, <laughs> uh, when they're emitted in the lungs, uh, you're, you're really running a chance of them hitting the DNA of the cell. There are several things that can happen when, when uh, alpha particles or radiation interact with cellular tissue. You can uh, have a result of a chemical change. Uh, you can actually cause the death of the cell, which is no problem. And if we're manufacturing cells all the time, those repair themselves, no problem. Or, if that alpha particle happens to hit one particular gene that uh, affects the replication of the cells and it just does damage to that, port, that one gene in the DNA string, then that cell will replicate itself not exactly like it should be. It's, it's a mutated cell and that's basically what cancer is, is rapidly uh, dividing mutated cells. Here's the other thing that we have to get into, and that's radon risk. Uh, keep, bear in mind we're talking risk here. Not everybody exposed to radon is going to get cancer. Uh, just like not everyone who, not every smoker gets lung cancer. In fact, only about 10% of them do, but they have a much greater risk than non-smokers. Uh, concept that we, you know, that we work with is the higher the concentration is, the less time you want to spend in it. Um, and, and basically their analogy here is throwing darts. If, if that bullseye on that target happens to be that particular gene that we're looking for in, in the uh, cellular structure, if I stood back and threw a dart at that, one dart at a time, uh, signifying a low concentration of radon, it's going to take me a longer time to hit that bullseye. Uh, and I may not hit it at all. And in that case, there was, you know, not that much risk. If I take handfuls of darts and throw them as fast as I can by the handful, probably a much shorter time and much better uh, potential for me hitting that bullseye at some point. This uh, chart shows how radon compares to other causes of death. And this is pretty significant. And this is the one that I like to point out. This is the number of lung cancer deaths per year from secondhand smoke, 3,000, compared to radon at 20,000. <coughs> and yet, on the other hand, we've had an outcry and a proliferation of regulations pertaining to secondhand smoke. This one is, at least in Nevada right now, it's not regulatory. This is how the radon-related uh, lung cancer compares to other uh, cancer deaths in the United States. And certainly we've all been concerned about all of these 
but not many of us have done the comparison. Essentially, any house, whether it's old, new, uh, whatever, if it has contact to the ground in some manner, has the potential for radon. It will enter uh, at slab joints uh, through any penetration uh, with pipes coming into the home, anything like that. And even if you don't have end cracks, but even if you can't see a crack in a slab, uh, a couple of things happen. There are microscopic cracks that you can't see. Uh, it will, it, it looks like a huge tunnel to the, to the radar. Uh, yes, it will move in through there. Radar can also migrate through concrete, concrete itself. Uh, there are really only, I used to say there were only two houses, two housing types that did not have the potential for radar. Uh, that was a mobile home without skirting, and that's important, without skirting, <coughs> excuse me, and, um, and houses that are built on stilts, which we don't have too many of. Uh, then someone pointed out to me that I had to include the tree houses as well. Uh, <coughs> Does that come in through frame floors where you don't have a slab? Yes, if it's in contact with the ground. Um, so there's an air space. There's an airspace that we'll collect in and we'll move on into the home. Uh, it's much the same thing as I said about the mobile homes. If you've got skirting around a mobile home, that skirting provides a collection area for the radon to move from the soil uh, to that area and eventually into the home. So it can permeate through linoleum, through carpet padding, through all that? Yes. Uh, linoleum, I'm not absolutely sure of that, but a solid sheet of linoleum. Chances are there's a crack around it somewhere. Uh, it'll get through, but actually permeating through, I'm not sure about that. Uh, it will eventually permeate through concrete. But the cracks in the concrete look huge to it, even if you can't see them. Uh, radon can come in through the water supply if you're on a, on a well. Uh, typically, and I think we've got a slide here that shows that it's not very much. Typically, though, water is not that much of a contribution to, to the annual radon concentrations. It's perfectly natural for a house to depressurize. Uh, one of the main uh, mechanisms for a house to depressurize is natural stack effect. Heated air rising out of the home causes a negative pressure inside the house. Uh, Any time that the pressure inside the house is less than the soil gas pressure, you're essentially going to suck it into the home, where it will build up in concentration. Uh, there are a lot of other factors that if we have kitchen fans, bathroom fans, turn those on, uh, they will depressurize the house. Other weather factors, uh, one that we would see around here a lot is wind. Uh, Blowing on this side of the house would cause positive pressure over here. Uh, but on this side of the house, as it comes over the top, it creates a negative pressure here. And that has a tendency to draw air out, out of the house and depressurize the house as well. There are many other things that affect the entry in. Uh, of radon. The fact is there are so many variable factors, both in the geology, the construction of the home, how we live in the home, uh, things like that. We see daily and seasonal fluctuations in radon concentrations. Uh, there are just too many variable factors to count. Uh, so certainly we recommend testing. As I said, radon can, if you're on if you're on a private well, it can come in through the water supply. <coughs> uh, typically, it adds less than 1% to the air, uh, compared to about 90% from soil gas. The other difference between that 90 and 91% and 100% is it can be building materials, that sort of thing. 
everybody likes a granite fireplace, right? <laughs> but again, very, very small. Same thing with granite countertops that came out a couple of years ago as, as an issue. Uh, it's, it was kind of a non-issue. Uh, without getting into it very deeply, I'll just tell you I have granite countertops in my home. Testing is the only way to know if you're at risk. Uh, we have many situations where people will test and, and not have a problem and the house next door has a problem. Uh, and vice versa. But uh, I, I've seen situations where you know one or two neighbors tested, they didn't have a problem, and the rest of the neighborhood decided, I'm not going to test, my neighbor's okay. Uh, when we went in and assisted them in testing, we found a very different situation. These are some of the types of uh, test kits. Most of these are passive. Uh, these two are the type that the University of Nevada Cooperative Extension uh, puts out. They are short-term tests. They are just different types of activated charcoal. Basically, when exposed to the air, the radon will absorb onto that charcoal. And uh, when you seal it up, send it back into the laboratory, they uh, take measurements on it and determine through calculation what your rate on concentration was. Uh, these are some other short term. These two I don't really recognize, but all of these are activated charcoal. This one is what's known as an E-perm. Uh, it's actually a Teflon disc that carries a, an electric charge. When it's exposed to uh, alpha particles, it discharges, and by measuring the difference between the original charge, uh, they can determine what your radon concentration is through calculation. And this is a long-term test kit, which uh, the University of Nevada Cooperative Extension also has. Uh, these uh, <coughs> should be used for at least no less than 30 days. Uh, my recommendation is to use these for an annual test if your original screening test is only slightly old. Uh, use these to get your annual average, which is the most definitive test that you can do. Obviously, if you're real high on your screening test, you're not going to get it down any, you know, a great deal lower. You don't need to do this. You probably want to consider mitigation sooner than that. And this is a continuous radon monitor. They're, you know, just an example. There are a bunch of them out there. Uh, they are very expensive units, typically used by professionals uh, either doing research or the professional uh, radar mitigation and radar measurement uh, folks. Uh, these actually can, depending on the model, can give a readout uh, at certain periods of time and they can log the results so that you can watch the radon concentrations and the fluctuations. <coughs> and they do need to be calibrated at least on an annual basis. Really important that they be calibrated. Okay, when when you do a short-term test, uh, we say that uh, screening test, we say that it should be done in closed house conditions. And what that means is that all exterior doors and windows are closed for at least 12 hours before the test and during the entire test, except for normal coming and going. Uh, you can still live in the house and, and go in and out. Uh, internal and external air exchange systems should be turned off, and if you do have a radar mitigation system and you're just testing to see what it would be without it, they should, uh, excuse me, to see what, if it's operating or not, it should remain on. Did you say, did you say that heating systems has to be turned off? Uh, no. Uh, internal and external air exchange systems. So if you have something that brings fresh air in to the home, that should be turned off. And wouldn't a furnace naturally do that? No. That, uh, it, it might bring in some fresh air, but that's combustion air. It's made up of combustion air. So heating would is okay. Uh, one of the biggest things that I've seen not up here, but certainly down in the valley, is people try to test during the summer. When they say, no sweat, I can test, I've got an air conditioner. What they actually have is a swamp cooler. 
Uh, we've got two problems with that. They're using an activated charcoal test, and the activated charcoal, uh, any moisture in the air uh, has a tendency to compete for its adsorption rate, uh, adsorption space on the activated charcoal. So that'll throw the test off. Plus, they're bringing in a whole bunch of outside air. Uh, it's not really close test conditions. You can test during the summer. If you're going to use, you have to do the closed house conditions, and in that case, you need a central air conditioner if you're going to use air conditioning at all. Uh, the testing location kind of depends if you're doing uh, testing for your own health. Uh, what we term here is a non real estate transaction. You always want to do it in the lowest living area. Uh, you may have, for example, a basement that you haven't finished and you don't live in. Uh, so in that case, lowest lived in area for a non-real estate test. If you're doing a real estate transit, uh, real estate test, it's the lowest lived in area or the lowest area that is suitable for occupants. What do you mean by a real estate test? Uh, basically, a lot of people, especially if they come from somewhere that is regulated, where testing is required uh, for a real estate transaction. When they come in and they're looking at a home, they may very well ask for a radon test. Um, we don't recommend that testing during a real estate transaction is the best time to do it. We think you should be doing it for your family's health rather than a real estate transaction. Unfortunately, during a real estate transaction, everybody wants the things done yesterday, and you don't have time to deal with this intelligently. Hey, we live in the real world, and we know that that's when most testing is done. And even that's better than none at all. You know, if the house has never been tested, and, I, and you're buying a house, ask for a radon test. Is the, uh, like the real estate area, is always the lowest area, and is that always the most severe exposure? Actually, the non-real estate is always the lowest lived in area. Even though it's uh, higher above the ground. <clears throat> right. During the real estate, what they mean here is you may have a basement that is uh, suitable for occupancy but has never been finished. I understand. You don't live there, but the next resident may. Oh. They, they may very well live there. So it's not always true that the <coughs> closest area to the ground is not always the highest. Not, not always true. Typically, we say test in the lowest area uh, because that's where the radon enters, right. and radon is, is heavier than air. Okay. So you're going to typically have the higher concentrations down here. Now, there are some exceptions to that. I Probably the most common that we would see here is a forced air heating system will circulate, and depending on where the air intake is for that, the recirculated air is is for that, it, you can get a really good circulation. In that case, both levels would probably be the same. And, and I, I have also seen typically houses that for some reason have a split entry um, type house, they get a real good mix too, even when the furnace is not. Um, there just seems to be a good circulation in, in those types of homes. Um, also, in choosing a place, definitely don't, as we mentioned, uh, moisture will impede. So you don't want to do your test in the kitchen. You don't want to do it in the closet or the bathroom. And not in the garage. Uh, and around here, I've seen a lot of people put their test kit in the crawl space. I've come close to living in the garage, but not the crawl space. So not a little blurry. Um, the choice, choice, I'm sorry, sir. If you sleep on the second floor, then it's good. Maybe. Better than sleeping on the first floor. Yeah. Uh, maybe. If, if you have a forced air, it's probably the same upstairs, you know, during the winter time. It's probably the same upstairs as it is downstairs. Uh, best choice to place it is bedroom or living room, family room, something like that. Placement in the room, I typically uh, 
tell folks that they should put it near an inside wall, but certainly if you're putting it near uh, an exterior wall, it should be an exterior wall with no openings. <coughs> it should be at least three feet uh, minimum away from any windows, uh, 12 inches minimum from the wall, and 20 inches minimum from the floor. So you don't three feet from the windows. Mm -hmm. All these instructions are inside the kits as well. I believe that diagram is as well. Right? Yeah. Where is that? Fold it, it up inside, in, the, inside the kit. Inside the kit. Oh, um, yeah, I'm kind of trying to place it someplace. You know, these, these are all minimums, 20 inches minimum, but try to place it somewhere where children or pets can't get to it and disturb it. This is the data sheet, and when, when you put your test kit out, extremely important to fill this out. Number one, they need to know where to send your report to. Uh, it's kind of amazing how many get back to the laboratory and they don't know where to send the report to. Uh, it's also extremely important to fill out the start date and time, and when you end the test, to fill out the end date and time. They use this to calculate your, your rate on uh, concentration. Uh, after you fill all that out, it's also extremely important to send this data sheet back with your test kit. Typically, after you've ended the test kit, filled all of this out, placed it in, uh, they are postage paid mailers. You need to get them in the post office that day uh, so that they'll arrive at the lab. They are time sensitive in, in getting them in. This is a three day test, right? Yes. Okay. And go ahead and keep a record of your serial number on your test kit. <coughs> Sometimes, if we don't get the name, uh, if you have that serial number and you happen to think about it and give it a call, we can probably find your results for you. The mailer looks small in here. It's just folded up in there. Can I mention something about the test kits while we're talking about them? There's two bags in the test kit. One's an inner bag and then one's the outer bag that you can see there. Be careful when you're opening that test kit and open just the outer bag. And get your, um, your instructions out of there in the data sheet. But then when you're ready to start the test, that's when you open the inner bag. And that's what starts it when the air starts uh, collecting it. When you get your test results back, if your result is uh, greater than 8 picocuries per liter, the recommendation is that you should probably confirm it with another short-term test. If the average of the two tests is above 4 picocuries per liter, you should consider mitigation in your life. If you get a result back that's between 4 and 8 picocuries per liter, the recommendation is to confirm it with a, uh, with a year-long test. If you recall, I said that that was the most definitive test that you can do. The EPA action level is also based on an annual average. Uh, there's a good chance that the annual average is, is less than your result on a short-term screening test. And typically, just rule of thumb, experience, it's usually about 50%. Not always, but it's, it's in that ballpark. So obviously, if you get one back up to 8 picocuries per liter, you could be below 4 picocuries per liter. Uh, if the result of a long, year long test is at or above 4 picocuries per liter, you should consider mitigation. Now, for the more sophisticated equipment for the year long test, is that something that the, that you loan or? Actually, it's, it's also a passive monitor. Uh, it's <coughs> you have one here? I think we have one right here by the Yeah. It's basically just a little canister. Uh, and it contains a piece of plastic in it. The eyeglass plastic that we were talking about. And you leave that in place for you a year? You leave that in place for a year. Now, two caveats. I would, number one, when you place this out, mark on the calendar a year from then when you need to pick it up. Uh, people forget them. And you're not told through windows? And no, no, no. For a whole year? No, oh, no, for a whole year. But this one, 
it takes into consideration the daily and seasonal fluctuations, but also how you live in the home. So it is the most definitive test. <coughs> the other thing to do is, when you write that on the calendar, write down where you put the paperwork. Because even if people find the kit, they can't remember where they put the paperwork. Can you back that up one slide? Um, should be able to. And basically, that's a piece of plastic in that little canister. It's a passing monitor. When you send it back to the laboratory, they etch it with acid, put it under the microscope, and count the little marks in it and determine what your rate of concentration is. You said it should be on the bottom where it should be mitigated. What do you mean by mitigated? Uh, fix the problem. Reduce your rate of concentration. How do you do that? We're going to have a gentleman tell you how to do that in a little bit. Uh, very shortly. I mean, these are all awfully small numbers you're getting, right? I'm sorry? These are awfully small numbers that you're giving us. Go to the next level. That, that small number is a measurement of the radioactivity that is present per liter of air. Uh, but if you kind of pull that in, and it's extremely complicated, you pull that into actual radiation exposure, those numbers change. Uh, it's a very high, even at 4 picocuries per liter, uh, it's a relatively high radiation exposure. I, I guess I'll, I'll let you know, a lot of people refer to this 4 picocuries per liter, that action level, as a safe level. There is no safe level of radon. Any exposure to radon has some risk associated with it, but the lower the concentration, the lower the risk. Um, this actually, the 14 curious per liter, that action, action level was based on several years ago, a lot of years ago, based on the ability of the current technology at that time to reduce the concentrations to that level or below. We're always going to have radon around us because it's in the outside air and we can never get below that outside air concentration. The national average for radon in the outside air is about 0.5 picocuries per liter. And if you recall, I said the idea is the higher the concentration, the less time I want to spend in it. So what I do, if I've got to live in this house for 30 years or 70 years or whatever, so I'm going to lower my concentration so that I can spend more time in it and reduce my overall exposure. Yes, if, if you're testing for a, you know, a PCI per liter for a year and it comes out to be eight, what effect does it have on you for that year that you've been living in the house? Those are low enough that, uh, you know, you've added a little bit of risk, but very little. Okay. Very little. The risk estimates, when they start looking at how many people will get lung cancer exposed to a given concentration, are based on a lifetime exposure. Now, if I'm doing it now at, at my age, I'm probably doing it not because I've got that many years ahead of me, but because I don't know what I was exposed to when I was a child in the house I was, grew up in, or any other house that I lived in since. I know a few of them. But, um, so, so the idea is, again, reduce that concentration as low as I can and reduce my overall risk. Um, if your result is less than 4 picocuries per liter, you probably don't need to do anything. Uh, but if you test it during the summer, they do recommend that you do a follow-up test during the heating season or do a year-long test just to put your mind at ease. Like I said, most of the tests you can do. <coughs> the EPA also suggests that you consider fixing a home if the levels are between 2 and 4 picocuries per liter. The reason for that is our technology has improved just a little bit. Uh, the mitigation systems that are used now, and even used several years ago, uh, I did some of the original research on the mitigation systems that are used now, but I did it almost 30 years ago. They're very effective. They're about 98% effective. And how much do these things, these tests cost? You mean the mitigation? Mm -hmm. We'll have a gentleman tell you that and just go ahead. I hate to take everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
but they are 90, about 98% effective. Um, that technology has improved just a little bit, and we're getting better pit trained people out there. It's not unheard of at all to get uh, in most houses now, the uh, concentration is down to around two people per year. Now, EPA's stand on this is that, you know, if you reduce uh, from three people curious to two people curious per year, you're going to get some risk reduction. Now, my take on it, though, is at that point it becomes a personal decision because it's going to cost the same amount to reduce from three to two as it will from 30 to two. And personally, how much risk, how much do I want to put into reducing how much risk? And it is a personal decision. So they, they still have their action level of four people curious per meter. 